So, uh, hello everyone. Pleasure to welcome you here at the first demo day of Fuel Arts, the accelerator empowering mm -hmm. our tech startups. My name is Dennis Belkovich. I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Fuel Arts. After its launch in fall 2019, me and the co-founder of Fuel Arts, uh, Roxana Zarniger, have faced with the pandemic that affected all the businesses and spheres of our life. And uh, our accelerator, in fact, had to reinvent its approach to educating startups, uh, working with the four our tech startups in a private acceleration mode in the last uh, 18 months. So together, we're holding uh, a hand on the pools of the art world. And uh, during the pandemic, we're trying to find the market fit on the changing art market. So um, our digital demo day presents the result of this extensive work. Well, um, and finally, we're grateful to our investors, both institutional and art strategists who funded us in summer 2021 and made the demo day happen and all the operations that are waiting for few hours beyond. So our today's venue is held in partnership with Amadeo Global Venture Capital Fund and F Money, a financial initiative for female investors. Uh, not to mention there would be another big event held today. Facebook has announced uh, that it changes its brand name. Uh, the name is still kept in secret, so uh, don't be surprised if it will be Fuel Arts as well. So uh, the first. The four pitches will be uh, preceded by a 30-minute panel devoted to the status of our tech and its investment attractiveness and opportunities. Not to mention the famous NFT trend, which attracts the attention of many of uh, today's guests. So, uh, to begin with, uh, as a result of a pandemic, the world I mean, both art world and financial world understood that business models must be flexible and able to move with ease between the physical and virtual worlds. Um, during the pandemic, digital art and transparency of transactions uh, simplified logistics. They helped keep collectors' attention and maintain deal flow. And according to our research, research of Fuel Arts in 2020, 21, the um, art tech sphere received nearly 60% of the industry's total investment over the last two decades, which is which equals to uh, a bit more than uh, $500 million, including the investment made to fuel artists, of course. So um, startups and their technologies were bought out by the market's heavyweights, uh, large sellers and venture capitalists. Uh, the Deloitte Art and Finance Report 2021, published three days ago, uh, has defined technologies as catalyst to reduce investment risk and increase transparency. Saying simple, from now on, art and te technology will develop together as industries in a symbiotic relationship. So I'd like to present my uh, co-moderator of the panel, uh, Katya Cohen, managing partner of Amadeo, and investment partner of Fuel Arts. Hi, Katya. Hi, guys. Good morning to those who are on the East Coast. Good afternoon to everyone in Europe, whenever, wherever <laughs> you're, you're watching this. <laughs> Thank you from Europe. <laughs> yes, very happy to have you here. Uh, obviously, we have huge interest from the crowd about this panel, about this demo day. Uh, we've been getting messages nonstop. I'm sure there are a bunch of people watching this now live, and I'm sure it will be a lot more watching it later. The reason why we're here today to discuss not only art, the traditional meaning of it, but also the tech, uh, the tech side, the tech sexy side of it. And you, as the experts from the industry, uh, will bring lots of value to this topic. Um, I think there are two reasons, like, and I'll introduce myself real quick, like two reasons why it's sexy these days. Um, well, I'm based here in New York City. I've been in the venture space in the, for the past, I would say, seven years. I've raised uh, four funds, invested in over 100 startups across different verticals, art, um, including art, um, you know, generated at least 35% IRR for my investors. 
and you know art basically for us as the venture uh, capitalists and investors we always look um, for that alpha right and make sure that we put our investors money to work so you know based on my background art is interesting historically the traditional art as you see myself I love traditional art and not only but um, historically the, there are two reasons right why we're here today and what we'll discuss um, art investments in art historically would generate I would say three to five percent IRR uh, from the art tech perspective from the VC side of it the returns for investors could be above 25 percent IRR right and that will be part of our conversation today so those investors who are watching this today um, keep watching because there is a lot of alpha here and we'll present interesting startups that could generate that alpha and obviously there is a second side of that retail investors um, those who have been pumping trillions um, you know and those retail investors who can't find um, you know certain alpha and the equity market so because it could be overpriced overvalued right now um, so they're, look, they're looking for other places to put their cash to work and art and art tech specifically these days is quite a sexy place and could 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 generate that alpha for retail investors as well. With that said, um, I would love to turn the table and ask uh, each of you to introduce yourself. Since we'll have startups pitching later, uh, my request would be please uh, come up with a, an elevator pitch, try to make it like one or two minute intro. Um, just to understand how startups feel and to be in their shoes. All right. So <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> great. <laughs> great. So, uh, well, then we'll start with Natasha. You seem to be the most ready one. Natasha, please introduce yourself and then we'll jump into, into questions after we, we make the first round sure. of interest. Also, what happens in the startup world? Lots of uh, <laughs> unexpected moments. <laughs> yep, that happens. But anyways, yeah. Natasha, let's let's move on. You have an interesting background and career. Would love to hear about it. Well, thank you. So yes, um, uh, let's see. I have about over fifteen years' experience in the art and startup world. I did not think that's how I was going to start out. So I started out getting a master's in art history with Christie's Education uh, in London. Uh, though I'm originally from New York, but from a very varied background, so. Uh, it was an amazing experience to study, particularly with Christie's, because I really wanted to have an experience that was a bit more hands-on instead of just theory and a little bit veering towards the business side of the art world. So I always knew I wanted to go to the business side, but I really thought I was going to go into the auction world afterwards, after graduating. And instead, I came back to New York and I was very quickly snatched up as a unpaid intern, because back in those days when you had a master's or a PhD, you know, you had to be an unpaid intern first. And uh, this is what I did. And I was very lucky that- uh, As all of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A uh, story of everyone who starts out, I think, in the art world. Uh, yeah, and after four months, uh, that turned into becoming the director at Collectrium and being part of a team of three people only uh, before there was really even a product. And um, we were just getting the product started. We had one in-house developer and one in-house UI UX designer. And uh, at the helm was Boris Pevsner, the, the CEO and, uh, and me. And it was kind of an amazing time because I, I had never thought I was gonna go into the startup world. And then poof, I was like Googling, how do you create iPhone, iPad apps? And, and that's how I actually started, just dropped into the water. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a time where uh, everything was kind of new. Um, iPad came out, I think, after I was working for about a year. So, uh, you know, we were one of the first people going to galleries and saying, this iPad thing is going to be really great as a sales tool. And they were like, what is this? It's like a phone, but bigger. I don't think so. So it was kind of an amazing process to go from being like the first people to talk about uh, this burgeoning technology to being like, it was amazing because we were the first and everybody kept saying, oh, maybe we'll go talk to them because they were the first ones telling us back a couple months ago that iPad was a big thing. And so that really kind of helped us. It was an amazing time. 
Uh, so after a, an incredible uh, six-year run at uh, Collectrium, that's when we started the process of being able to, to uh, go ahead with the buyout, which was a long process. Also with Christie's, I was very lucky that being part of the sort of Christie's family, as it were, by, by being a graduate from there, um, I got sort of invited in a little bit easier to, uh, to go through a lengthy process to begin to show what our product could do, uh, understand what their needs were, see what our competitors were doing, um, watch their clients uh, use our system and a competitor system at the same time, uh, learn how that whole process uh, goes in terms of videotaping a collector, or a, you know, maybe a slightly older collector who's not super tech friendly using your product and seeing where they stumble and fall. And um, yeah, it was an incredible ride. And we were lucky enough that uh, we were able to get a successful buyout and uh, what an incredible experience. So after that, uh, went on to Artnet um where i absolutely worked with roxana and uh yeah had a fabulous time uh being in new york and i mean you know rox is like this legendary person so it was like oh i'm gonna get to work with this legendary person because essentially she poached me from collector which was awesome <laughs> and uh it was fantastic and i got to be director of fulfillment and see the other end of what i was working with because director of fulfillment was really all about uh seeing the sales process after the gavel goes down. So seeing how do you fulfill a sale? What happens after you win a sale on the internet? Is it all smooth sailing from there? How do you affect payment? Uh, how do you do, how do you deal with shipping? How do you deal with shipping errors? How do you deal with that entire process? And, and applying that whole sort of eBay, Amazon sale process to the art world is a very interesting uh, process that comes with its own pitfalls and its own issues. So that was really fascinating. And um, because I was in that process, uh, trying to figure out how we could use technology to make uh, payments a lot easier and more automated, uh, this is what gave me the idea for ArtPay. And uh, in, in interesting timing, my fabulous then boyfriend, uh, now husband, uh, proposed to me. So I moved from New York to Paris. And uh, this is why I uh, wasn't able to continue with ArtNet, but it was for like the best of reasons. So um, they were lovely and gracious. And Jacob, the CEO, said, go, go do your project as, a, as your own startup. Um, we don't actually want to be entirely mired in that. So we'll be like your first clients if you go do that. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. And, and then I went off to go do uh, my own startup. But of course, very different doing that in Europe. So very different. Very, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting experience becoming uh, incorporated within France and then also within the U.S. It's a very different process. Um, I'm not a French citizen, uh, as it were, yet. So it's a very interesting process learning how to not only just get around payments, but uh, how it's like to be a startup in France and Europe. And um, it's a very different experience. I've had to really switch how I speak. Um, there's a, a way in which you speak to investors in the U.S. That is not how you would speak to French investors or to European investors in a as a whole. So you really have to learn the, the cultural differences when you're a startup that's working on a more global platform about how you even venture the idea of how much investment funds you're looking for, all that. Okay. So put all that together. And, and there's my, my 15 years of experience. And uh, almost two minutes pitch, a little bit more. But we'll there we go. I did my best. <laughs> nice. Nice try. Thank you, Roxana. Um, well, you have to you have to know <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it really short natasha's life is much more interesting than mine oh, please, so I'll, please. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just take this much um so look former coo of christie's auction house of the americas um actually youngest female coo in the 200 year history i do have to and that's just for all yeah. the girls out there you know Absolutely. definitely all the girls opening the doors for us Hopefully, uh, then went on to senior vice president of Artnet Auctions with Natasha. We actually redesigned and re-engineered the platform um, and added some pretty uh, catalysmic tools that increased our sales and revenue in one year by 33%. We sold the Kusama online for $300,000, yeah, first, first time ever. Um, and also won an honorary Webby for our design. So, you know, good to see you, Natasha. It's been a while. Congratulations yeah. on everything. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then went on after Artnet to um, 
become a full-time professor at Parsons School of Design Strategies and Management in their master's program, uh, which I'm currently teaching now, did two years at Sotheby's Institute, um, which I found was the inspiration for me to start talking to Dennis and start developing a disruptive model for the education process in the art world. Um, you know, like, like Natasha, I started at Christie's thinking I would do one thing and then realized that the art world actually is an ecosystem that involves a lot of other subsidiary businesses that make it breathe and run on a day-to-day -day basis that have nothing to do with the actual buy sell transaction and if you look at the model of the art world the buy sell transaction is only this much and the rest of the world consists of about 15 different sub businesses that all need disruption so when i realized that um which was an alarming moment at Sotheby's Institute, I realized that neither Sotheby's nor Christie's would ever be able to build something that kind of looks at all the other business models. Um, so I started writing a white paper. Then I got a call from Dennis who said, go to Staten Island and get your visa. Was it Staten Island? No, <laughs> Coney Island. Get your visa and come to Russia and speak at a collector summit. And I said, well, who would say no to that? So got my visa, flew to Russia in April of 2019, met Dennis and had the wonderful pleasure of watching him organize what I thought was one of the most complex events to organize. And you know, prior to my Christie's and art days, I, I was COO of uh, the Olympic games for three Olympic games under a sponsor, under a logistics sponsor. So watching someone organize an event of that complexity really impressed me. And I knew that Fuel Arts had to sit somewhere. Um, so I approached him and asked him if he was interested. And fast forward, a pandemic happened, which I think was a silver lining because Dennis, I always debated with Dennis on whether we should do this in person or not. And I think this actually worked out nicer. Um, and so I have to honestly take the rest of my time to say, Dennis, you have done a fantastic job keeping this idea I had three years ago alive. Thank you. Thank you for owning it, running it, and being a great leader. I'm always here for you. Um, currently, I'm an art tech investor um, and a mentor and a strategic advisor to art tech platforms that are there to disrupt the art world. Uh, heading to London next week, uh, and I see that Louise is in the house, so I just need to give a shout out to Louise Hamlin, who's another great innovator in the art world. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing Louise in 3D next week, and uh, you know, really open to seeing what we can do in the new art world. Amazing. Thank you so much, Roxana. And I think, Dennis, your turn to introduce yourself, and then we'll kick it off for uh, panel conversation. I, I would say uh, I would say the best introduction of uh, me uh, should be split between what Roxana has said and what will the startups will say during their pitches. So I'm in between. Uh, I believe it's much more interesting for our audience, which is uh, quite big right now, uh, to um, hear the replies of uh, our speakers to to the questions we we. Uh, created. Amazing. Let's kick off with the first question. Sure. Uh, Roxana, and it comes from what you have been talking about earlier. So um, today the art world is uh, witnessing a generational shift. Uh, the silent generation, the main buyers for decades are being replaced by millennials and Gen Z with new money, including crypto. So those uh, new collectors, they combine an um, investor's acumen with the desire for transparency and fun. But today, the physical worlds of art and the digital, digital world are like two separate planets, each with its own inhabitants, values, and codes of conduct. So uh, from your perspective, how easily these two worlds could merge and what are the in instruments to support that process? besides fuel arts? Uh, I think, I think a, number one, a passion to make the art world a better place, period. 
you have to be in this for that reason. Um, and number two, to look at the existing businesses that are out there that are trying really hard to do better and to support them. Uh, a quick example is art finance. You know, I've been heavily involved in understanding where I, art finance, finance started and where it's ended up. That is, that is a part of the art world that hasn't changed since the 1970s. So without going into too much detail, the opportunities are there. The tools are already in place. They just need some revision and updating and a great smile on your face and the, and the, and the, you know, the leadership or the, the, the gumption to go out there and try it. So the tools really are out there. You have to be resourceful and you have to be brave because the art world is a wonderful place, but I believe in the next 10 years, it could be an unbelievably incredible place. Thank you for Great. that. Uh, I actually have a next question for Natasha. Um, you know, you mentioned that you sold your startup, uh, Collectrum, uh, for almost 20 million to Christie's, which was one of the most successful exits in the industry. How would you describe um, any challenges that startups face these days? And I would say the additional second question is, um, what do you think are requirements from investors in art tech? Like, what are the, what is that you've seen in between, I don't know, 10 years ago and right now, the moment, right? Like what, what hmm. changed? Sure, yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting actually, because I think in a weird way, I feel that I'm seeing some very similar things to what I experienced a while back, because of course uh, I went through the period of the crash the Damien Hurst crash, as it was referred to. I actually did a, a short course with Sotheby's Institute in London right before I came back to New York and I was doing their art business short course. So I actually went to the Damien Hurst auction and as I'm watching things just go for insane amounts, I'm getting texts from my friends who are working in finance, like, oh my God, everything is about to absolutely implode. Like you need to really think about this. And I'm like, thinking, oh, what? that sounds a bit ominous. What's going on here? So, you know, it was a strange but also really informative experience to uh, create a startup right during the time of a huge economic crash. We were very worried we weren't going to get any investment. Um, you know, we were very lucky that Boris came in with a certain amount of investment on his own because he had had a previous startup that sold uh, the, called Xfire that was about multiplayer gaming that that had sold quite well, and so he had enough funds to, to carry us through before we found uh, a lot of other investors. Um, which I think unfortunately or fortunately is very similar to what's going on right now because of the pandemic. So the pandemic kind of created the same sort of moment where everything sort of freezes for a second, everyone gets a little nervous. At the same time, you know, investors always come back in when they start to see a trend or an opportunity. And I think that's the beautiful part is right after a little dip like that, which I think we're already seeing now, um, you know, from talking to other startups and talking to investors and just, uh, you know, listening to people in my family already who are, uh, trying to invest in art themselves uh, you know it's why you see nfts and, and other things having an uptick right now is because uh, there's always a renaissance after a crash and already i think we can see the 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 view of the renaissance is coming into clear picture right now so um yeah i would say that it's very similar actually to the time that i went through right before uh collection really took off where we were still trying to get off the ground during a crash and then in terms of sale, you know, I mean, buyouts are always very difficult. I mean, we have this wonderful, um, you know, title of being the, the best buyout in the startup world. But, um, you know, it was a six year process. It does not happen overnight. I think startups have to remember that. Um, and it's all about showing, you know, what kind of long term value you can provide to the person that's buying you out, right, to the group that's buying you out. I think that there are a lot more art startups that are poised in a really good space now more than ever, because there are more uh, companies instead of just your standard bricks and mortar auction houses that are getting more interested in potentially partnering or doing a buyout with art startups. So I think that's really what has changed a lot since my time. In my time, it was really just who's gonna buy us. It's gonna have to be a collector themselves that just is very eccentric and wants to buy us out or an auction house. We were really like in two groups there. Um, and I think now it's a lot more expanded. So yeah. And what do you think in terms of investors' behavior? Like, 
Investor mm-hmm. behavior. Well, I think what's really interesting is that back in my day with Collectrium, there was much more education I was having to do all around. Um, education in terms of the technology to investors and then education in terms of the art world to the business guys. So, you know, there was always a, um, a business investor, you know, um, advisor that I was having to speak to when I was talking to individual investors. And then, you know, even in terms of talking to the CTO over at Christie's, you have to switch tack then. So you're describing the art world more to the tech guy, you're describing, you know, the technology to the business guy. I feel like that has gotten a little bit better though. It's really impressive to me how many investors are very up on what's going on with NFTs, on what's going on with cryptocurrency in general, what's going on with blockchain. So there's a little less of me having to come in and say like, okay, well here, let me explain the entire art market and let me also explain the entire business market at the same time. So that's, I think, kind of nice for, for art startups that I see you can pull on the fact that more investors are, are aware of the art world, but also the technical digital side of the art world, which is new, that wasn't always the case. That's great. Uh, good. Uh, so, Katya, you, you started a very interesting topic, and uh, Natasha told me about her experience, but, I mean, her previous experience, uh, but uh, today art strategists, I mean, top auction houses and dealers, uh, have made a considerable investment contribution to art tech, uh, I mean, during pandemic. Uh, for instance, uh, Covella Galleries invested uh, by rumors more than 10 million in uh, foundation app and NFT marketplace. Uh, Recently, Sotheby's purchased a 20 million stake in an NFT uh, production company uh, to create its own metaverse. And um, along with uh, the art strategist, we see an increase of institutional and VC investors excitement towards art tech. Uh, Let's say Masterworks platform offering fractional ownership of art received a 110 million investment this fall in round A. Uh, by the way, b- led by uh, Left Lane Capital, an institutional investor. So um, the question to both of you, but please uh, let's start with Roxana. How do, you, how could you comment on the big money interest towards art tech now? I mean, I think. From seven years ago until now, art tech has taken the lens and zoomed out away from building marketplaces and looked at all the other different facets. I hope that continues. Um, I think the greatest misconception that people outside the art world have is that the entire revenue stream comes from a buy and sell, which is absolutely incorrect. That is actually the most cost heavy part of the art world ecosystem and all of the other subsidiary businesses kind of carry that. Um, And the more we focus on the subsidiary businesses like Arta is doing and Adam Fields or what Natasha is doing or what Louise is doing, the more we're going to understand how to, how to change it. Um, So I think what big money can do is look at all of the subsidiary industries that actually keep the art world afloat. Instead of focusing on building a metaverse, which is not even 15 years away, why don't you focus on building smart contracts or fixing art finance or storage services can be elaborated to much more than just putting your art in a crate and saving it for 15 years. What else can we do with that? Um, Opportunity zones. How can opportunity zones support a neighborhood that's growing and insert people in, within the neighborhood to love and enjoy art instead of just storing it and hiding it away. So, I mean, I can go on and on, but big money needs to stop focusing on the metaverse and selling the piece and actually enjoying the piece because in essence, the art world is one big logistics business with one transaction of a buy and sell. And everyone is focused on building a marketplace. Waste of time. Christie's and Sotheby's do it great don't need another one. But think of all the peripheral businesses that Christie's and Sotheby's don't do great and support that. Thank you, Roxana. I felt myself like uh, sitting on your lecture again, that, that were the best <laughs> lecture at Sotheby's Institute of Art. But nowadays I'm I'm proud having you as a co-founder and a board member, which is <laughs> much more important and valuable for, for our business. Uh, Natasha, what could you add, please? 
Oh my gosh. I mean, she's spot on, you know, as per usual. Uh, yeah, I think, I think here's the thing. I mean, I think most people uh, forget, because even with like the new NFT craze, I'll just touch on that very quickly, that a lot of people have started out with like NFT, you know, sales platforms and things like that. It's a, a bit of a rage right now. And I do wish that investors would remember that while, I mean, you can have tons of marketplaces. I don't think there's a problem with that, especially like niche marketplaces. If you want to have a marketplace that's dedicated to a very specific type of art, that's fabulous so that it, it can kind of um, take down some of the visual overload that a lot of uh, collectors can feel. So when you have like one marketplace that's selling too much, sometimes it gets to be a little too heavy and it's, you know, you get visualed out. And so I think that's great to have niche marketplaces. There's a space for that. But I would say that, you know, Rox is completely correct. Uh, most people ignore that the real meat and potatoes of the industry is what happens between the sale, at the end of the sale, around the sale, the getting the work from one place to another, where does it sit? If you have a marketplace, are you going to be like a bricks and mortar where you buy that work in? Do you own that work and then you're selling it? If not, well, then uh, what are you going to do? You're going to trust that uh, third party seller has the correct item. I mean, these are all things you have to think about in the same way that, you know, Airbnb has to think about this the same way that eBay has to think about this, um, you know, but it can be a dirty word sometimes in the art world to think about logistics and not just the, you know, the glamorized beauty of just the artist and the purity of selling the artwork, you know, but unfortunately it's, or fortunately, you know, because it's fabulous to see a great artwork that you love, but it's even more fabulous to have it delivered correctly, to have it framed properly, to have it not break, to have it keep its value, to have it insured. These are things you got to think about, you know, so it's, it's uh, like a child, you know, you don't just have a kid and then, oh, all right, that's it. You know, you got to think about all the accoutrements that come with that. So uh, people have to think about it. Art, art, you know, it's it's your baby. So you got to think about all the different industries that can go around that and uh, and service it well. Speaking of babies, <laughs> almost babies, <laughs> um, tech investors pump millions into NFTs, obviously, NFT startups and uh, as a digital um, digital collectibles boom. So what is your perspective uh, because I see a bunch of investors running around like chickens going crazy about NFTs. Uh, what's your perspective? And I think that's the question for both of you. And that would be the last question, unless there are more questions from the audience. Um, and then we'll move to, to, to the pitches. Well, why don't I go first since mine's going to be provocative and then Natasha can always <laughs> put a nice rainbow around it. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. <laughs> Shoot straight uh, forward, right? <laughs> um, I love it. Go for it. <laughs> I think, look, I think the NFT technology for the art world is absolutely fascinating. Um, I was speaking to uh, someone on CNBC the other day. Um, I wasn't on CNBC. He works for them, and he's a watch collector. And he used NFTs to track his provenance of his watches when he sold them. Now that's an interesting way of looking at NFTs. Uh, what do I think about buying a work of, well, let me reframe. What do I think about creating an NFT? I think it's super cool. I, 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 I would definitely have everyone try to create an NFT at least once in their life. Um, I would definitely play around in the NFT market, but and this is to the new generation that keeps saying, oh, you're killing our planet. You're killing our planet. There is no ESG model in the NFT world. So instead of blaming the previous generation, stop making millions of dollars on a cartoon and figure out how to add ESG to the model, and then I'll invest in it. Otherwise, all you're doing is you're doing the same thing that we did, and you're just as guilty as us. Natasha, could you make that prettier? <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, sparkles on top. <laughs> sugar, sugar coat. I mean, yeah, you know, uh, I have to agree with you. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, uh, yes. Okay. So, what are I think the pitfalls of the NFT, you know, market? A, that it's, yeah, you know, it got a huge cost uh, to the environment for sure. Um, you know, I think. I think the other pitfall for it is that it, you know, some people are going to be a little worried that um, it's going to be a bit of a fad and that it's eventually going to kind of fizzle out. That's a valid concern as well, for sure. I think two things. One, I mean, Roxanne is essentially correct. 
that uh, you know we have to think about how do you you know the the environmental impact of NFT is a much larger question that isn't like specific to our industry even, and that you know people have to take into consideration. Um, the same way that we're taking into consideration that like electric cars aren't always the best for the environment because how are you producing electricity? You know, nothing is a fix all. Everything is interconnected these days. So we have to think in a more interconnected way about how to solve these things. So that's my pretty, pretty answer for, <laughs> for Roxanne's <laughs> point of view there, which I totally agree with. Um, I mean, my other thought with NFT is that I think I find it fascinating uh, just to give you a little bit of European perspective on NFT to let you know that it is actually taking off here in France. I think most people thought that it wouldn't take off in Europe as a whole or in France, especially because France is very risk averse, um, but it's actually taking off completely. And, uh, you know, I, I have an incredible example of my, my husband, who's the head of finance at WWF, so World Wildlife Fund uh, here in France. And um, they just had a collector who decided the way he wanted to donate to WWF is that he wanted to buy an NFT version of the little panda icon that represents the, the fund. And I was shocked to hear this, but I thought, all right, I mean, more proof, this is really taken off in France. This is a French investor. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it is, it is something that I think will stick around for a while because uh, yeah, there's always something incredibly, I think, especially after the pandemic, we all have this idea that there are ways in which we want to enjoy uh, artwork that is just through the internet and where it's very traceable. So yes, like applying NFTs to uh, watch collecting to lots of traditional forms of collecting is obviously going to come into play the same way that we knew this was gonna happen once blockchain came on the scene. Like obviously blockchain has all these amazing applications in the art world um, in terms of tracking and tracing. So obviously this is gonna stay around for a while. So it's all about how do we use it best? How do we be most responsible with it? How do we, you know, Get how it we, to serve us well. How do we take care of that baby? I'll wrap, I'll exactly. wrap up with that there you comment. Go. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, Dennis, we have amazing panelists, but we also have amazing female founders that are coming up next. Um, and Dennis, I'll let you... Three female founders and one male founder. Yes. Oh, sorry, right. four female founders, because one startup has uh, two female founders. And uh, only one startup. I just I, I wanted I wanted to uh, to proceed with the following that you know uh, regarding NFTs, uh, two of the four startups of the first batch have already made the pivot and are dealing with NFTs. Uh, the third startup early is baby hesitating. Early baby. Yes, <laughs> and the fourth one and the fourth one. Uh, still doesn't know that that's his destiny to 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 become an NFT uh, art market game. So he doesn't but, know it yet. All right. <laughs> yes. So uh, that that's how we're uh, we're shifting to uh, we're shifting to the uh, presentation decks. Uh, I would ask you to, uh, as the 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 mentors of of Fuelers, to listen attentively and uh, to don't hesitate uh, asking them questions. Uh, Provocative so, questions as investors. Yes. yes. You know, grill them. <laughs> provocative, provocative uh, questions, which uh, would make them thrilling. But from the other hand, uh, again, thank you for, for a brilliant panel and um, for your re replies. Uh, before I introduce the the startups and we start the second part of the demo day. Um, I'd like to introduce the mentors of the first batch who made uh, who made this happen. So, uh, first of all, proud to introduce uh, Katya Cohen and Olga Fried. Uh, they were responsible for general mentorship and business modeling. Um, besides managing uh, F Money, they also and Amadeo, uh, respectively. They are also mentoring at 500 startups, Mass Challenge, Free, and uh, Techstars. Um, so uh, Market Feed and UX UI uh, was mentored by Danny Setiavan. Uh, Maria Savelyeva was responsible for go-to-market strategy. Uh, financial modeling was uh, done by Diego Berrio and uh, Terry Choi from Amadeo Global and the 13 Ventures. Thank you, guys. Uh, tech and blockchain were uh, split by um, 
Tim Kampanchenko and Peter uh, Vainitsky, our tech mentors. And of course, our today's panelists have made a great contribution, uh, Roxana Zarniger, Natasha rotman Letanur, and uh, Nani Dekin, who had his own reason to leave. So they were responsible for arch market feed and networking. Mm. And not to mention the few large staff, uh, Sonia Stubblebine, the project manager, uh, Nastasia Mamantova, assistant manager and coordinator, and our SMM intern, Lola. Thank you, guys. And um, also, yeah, the, the last thing is uh, uh, the, design, the design team. So our art director, Alexei Kohanov from uh, Ukraine and our uh, video production manager, uh, Yana Barkova from Moscow, Russia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I feel like in the real movie, you know, before the, it starts. <laughs> the credits are real. <laughs> exactly, but it's very important that. to give credit where credit is due. I think that's great. <laughs> So with that said, thanks a lot, Dennis. Let's open the floor to and, and watch the real movie. Yes, uh, thank you, everyone. So uh, the first uh, startup I would like to welcome to our uh, Fuel Arts Demo Day stage, stage is Arterium and uh, Pavel Rapchevsky. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Pavel Rapchevsky, founder of Arterium. NFT portfolio and index app. One of the main trends of 2021 was boom of the NFT market. A typical collector has NFT works from different platforms. In this situation, he doesn't have a clear understanding of the state and value of his NFT collection. Ethereum is the NFT platform to aggregate your NFT collection in one place. Also, Ethereum is the index that presents current valuation of your NFT collection. So, you receive credible information to sell your assets at the right time and maximize your profit. By connecting his wallet to Ethereum, collector can see all NFT works that were purchased at different platforms on one screen. The process is easy and convenient. If collector use crypto wallets like MetaMask, the connection is done with only one click. In other case, collector can put his wallet's addresses manually and all his NFTs will present it in his full portfolio. We don't transfer, store or own NFTs. We only collect information from blockchain. Ethereum shows health history, provenance of each NFT piece, an index that is based on social and market activity of each artist. In 2021, NFT market is estimated around $5 billion. The number of NFT collectors has rapidly increased since 2019 and continues to grow daily. Our initial idea was to tokenize physical art. But with the boom of the NFT market, we decided to focus on NFT portfolio. We're discussing a partnership with Digital Registry Artory for NFT provenance and marketplace blockchain.art for transaction data. Now we're in the process uh, of the creating MVP and we are planning to release public version of the platform in 2022. Our business model is premium subscription with monthly fee of $9.99. Our team is already complete. I have more than 20 years of experience in IT sector from implementing electronic declaration system in Russia to business development IT startups such as Bank, uh, Pastry, Hash Rating, Atom Market, Easy Business Community, and others. Maria Savelova is our chief marketing officer with 10 years of experience in digital marketing. Piotr Wernitsky is our IT advisor with 15 years of experience in IT and blockchain. Our art uh, finance advisor, Denis Belkevich, is an art economist with 12 years of experience. We are happy to introduce our mentors. Natasha Letener, go to market strategy. She sold her collection management startup Collectium to Christie's for $17 million in 2016. Nani Dekin helped us with art market fit 
his startup Arctor is a blockchain based provenance tool. Igor Avdonin is an expert in scaling business to global markets. The NFT index is our secret sauce because we believe that information and trading signals are key to success. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, thank you for your uh, brilliant deck. So, um, thank you. Who has who has the question towards Pavel? I do. Roxana, uh, please. Pavel, really great idea. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Beautiful presentation. Could you elaborate a bit more on some of your strategic partnerships? Are you currently negotiating? What are you targeting as strategic partnerships, and who is on board now, um, aside from Artery? Uh, thank you so much for your question, Roxana. Um, when negotiation with Arthur and Blockchain Art on the technical partnership uh, that will lead to mutual benefits for both parties. For instance, uh, Arthur have uh, introduced the unique NFT finance tool. It's uh, like a digital certificate uh, to improve and secure NFTs. Uh, using the Arthur data, we will have uh, additional information about users' NFTs and uh, show it to our customers. Through our app, collectors can check uh, if their NFTs are secured uh, by Arthur and uh, if not yet, <laughs> order the certificate from them. In return, Arteum uh, would provide the NFT indexes uh, for customers of Arctic. And uh, um, the most important, uh, it's our free marketing channel for user execution. As uh, for NFT marketplace blockchain.art, we are going to test uh, data mining uh, with their platform and uh, track the trade transactions. Um, it's uh, not my first startup, and I, I know <laughs> and at, at, at the moment early adopters and customers are of most importance for us. Artory and blockchain.art have thousands of customers, and we hope that uh, these two collaborations will enrich the client database of Artigo. And <laughs> thank you so much for your question, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, I'd like to add, you've mentioned uh, blockchain art, blockchain .art. Uh, We've just received a, a message from, uh, uh, from the founder, Christina Steinbrecher. She wishes us good luck. She wishes you good luck. And I also proud to say that uh, recently Christina received uh, $400,000 of investment from the Bay Area, from the institutional investor. So uh, that also shows that the interest of institutional investors towards our tech is, is great and you've chosen the right persons for uh, even possible cooperation. Thank you, Christina. And uh, yeah, do we have the other questions or we are out of timing? No, we're, I'm going to be the bad cop today. Uh, we're moving to the next, to the next <laughs> Thank presentation. You so much. Have a nice Thank day. you, Pavel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pavel. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to uh, present you the, the second uh, startup with their deck, uh, VRT, uh, which is uh, a bit, pr I mean, uh, I'm proud to say that I'm also uh, originally Ukrainian as the founders of VRT. So uh, VRT from Ukraine, who have already showed a good traction being released one year ago at uh, Apple Store and uh, Google Play. The rest, uh, Anastasia will tell us. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Good day, everyone. I'm Anastasia Glebova, CEO and co-founder of VRT, platform to exhibit, sell, and collect digital art. And we make our digitalization easy. In March this year, we we'll woke up in the new reality. A reality where this amazing digital artwork was for the first time sold for $69 million. And this moment was when the digital art became a headline in all the media outlets worldwide. But even though the cases are getting bigger and the market has reached a $2.7 billion growth this year, 
Even if you have paid multi-million check for the artwork you like, it still does not mean that you're fully protected. Legal cases and the questions of liquidity is what arise more and more on the market. And therefore, a $2.7 billion market now faces a problem with a lack of liquidity, where art buyers do not have solutions to manage the digital artworks and the intellectual property rights to them, while a new niche of let's say, physical art market professionals, such as galleries and museums, finds the entrance to this digital revolution more and more complicated and costly. Therefore, the VR strategy lies in bridging the digital and physical art markets and therefore helping a $50 billion art industry to get closer to the digital asset industry. VR is a platform where you can exhibit, sell, and collect digital art. We provide a whole ecosystem of immersive digital spaces combined with digital authenticity solutions and, of course, the marketplace where you can buy both digital and digitized art in the form of NFT or a license where you can get the intellectual property rights to the artwork to both enjoy and deploy your art as a real digital asset. Our business model is built on two main parts. Of course, as a main revenue stream is a marketplace commissions, both from primary market and the secondary one for NFTs and licenses, as well as a supporting subscription system, which help us to acquire clients and extend their LTVs while providing them with our technology for virtual exhibition, which combines 3D, AR and VR technologies and is now represented both on our mobile application and web platform with the whole system of digital authenticity solutions uh, with a unique system of licenses and the digital certification, which helps you to track not only the history of transactions, but also the provenance of the artwork in a convenient way in the real time basis. Starting in March 2020, we have achieved pretty a lot. We have over 6,000 active app users from 78 countries and over 100,000 visitors to the web platform. We got selected as the winners of the Creative Business Investor Pitch this year by Creative Business Network, and we're exhibiting at CADA, which is the biggest global art fair. We have received investments and grants, and just the last month, we hit the MRR of $17,000. So what is next? The next step for us is, of course, to enhance the marketplace, the beta of which was launched just the last month. We also will represent the art at the Web Summit via Beta Starter Program, raise a pre-seed round by the end of the year, and enter the metaverse with our strategic partner, DSL Collection. For the next year, we have even bigger plans to introduce a multi-blockchain solution to address an even bigger audience and provide an automated certification, reach a point of sales, and reach the seed round by the end of the year. Our team has it all. We combine the expertise and background in the fields of art, IT, and art and finance, but what is even more unique for the sphere mostly ruled by tech startups, we have uh, two of our co-founders are uh, IP lawyers, and who if not we know how to manage the IP rights in the sphere. And even though here you can see just five of our co-founders, there are 19 more wonderful people who help us to be this extensive ecosystem globally. We are also strengthened by a board of experienced advisors whose many years of experience on the global art market help us to make our product truly market fit. So what I want you to remember is that VART combines NFTs with intellectual property rights management and therefore provides 11 new ways to monetize digital art except for NFTs. We are united by an ambitious goal to breach the digital and physical art markets. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Anastasia. Ambitious goal, ambitious questions. So who will be uh, so ambitious to ask the question to ambitious VR? <laughs> sure, I'd love to ask a question. So well done, by the way, very good presentation. Thank you. Very lovely. Uh, so can you just elaborate a little bit more on how you're building out the ecosystem that you touched upon in the presentation? Mm -hmm. So basically, the VR tech system is built on three main kind of key points. Uh, first of all, is what we have started with when we pivoted when the pandemic was kind of outbreaking. We had to answer the question: what to do with digital art? How to deploy it? How to interact with it? Like what 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 stays behind buying a JPEG video or art and so on? So first uh, step is of course our virtual exhibition technology. 
where you can create your own virtual space, you can lease it, you can get it via subscription so that you can make your art available anytime and anywhere for people already from 78 countries, just from their devices. We also have the system of embedded modules, so it can be presented both on our platforms or embedded into the gallery site, museums, public, private collections, and so on. Second part is, of course, the marketplace, where we sell both NFTs and this requires a system of licenses, a certain amount of intellectual property rights to them. Basically, it provides you with, with the rights to use art further after buying for commercial, non-commercial purposes, creative or exclusive. And the last but not the least is, of course, the digital authenticity system, which consists of the system of licenses and a unique way of, to certify art. Because uh, the main reason why this lack of liquidity happens is uh, that only the history of transactions is getting recorded. And when we talk about art, and that's, that's what we are doing here today, we all know that not only the transaction is what makes art valuable, is what makes mm -hmm. liquid as an asset. That's mm -hmm. also highly important to track all other different types of events, including exhibitions, and that's where the system of licenses comes hand in hand because you can do it all automatically and track all uh, this provenance history in the real time basis. Great. Amazing. The, yeah, the bad stuff is on. Uh, we're out of time, so we have to move to the next presentation. Uh, Nastasia, thanks a lot. It was very nicely done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, I'm happy to welcome the... No, before I will introduce the, the uh, third startup, I should say that uh, several hours prior to our uh, demo day, we received a lot of uh, emails from uh, our friends, from our colleagues from the art market, uh, from our partners who were wishing us luck and uh, to to the organizers of uh, Fuel Arts, to its uh, board members, and to the uh, to, to the panelists and uh, to the startups. So, um, along with uh, Christina Steinbrecher from Blockchain.art, uh, we also received a letter from Adriana Piccinati di Torcello, the head of uh, Deloitte Art and Finance Luxembourg, uh, who was presenting his brilliant. Uh, art and finance report, uh, global report, uh, three days ago. Thank you, Adriano and uh, startups. I I uh, send the words of uh, I, I send your hi to to, to the startups uh, and also um, Anders Peterson uh, from Art Tactic London, um, the co-creator of the Deloitte Art and Finance report, um, is watching us from uh, Rome, Italy, <laughs> so from a uh, well-deserved uh, rest. Thank you, Anders. Uh, and uh, we're moving on. And the third uh, startup is, um, I mean, the idea of the third startup uh, could have emerged only during some uh, crazy times. But the idea is really disruptive. It's uh, barter between art and uh, goods and services. Uh, I'm happy to welcome uh, Ksenia Zaitseva and uh, Fresh or Trash. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, hello, my name is Ksenia Zaitseva. I'm the founder of Fresh or Trash Startup. It's a butter platform to exchange goods and services for art. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among the most disruptive events in the modern history and the financial disaster for many. We learn to spend less and waste less. In 2020, consumers went online to find affordable goods and services. People became local, price sensitive, focusing more on saving. While staying at home, art buyers got interested in art marketplaces to minimize costs and agent fees. At the same time, artists also went online for additional self-promotion. So both sides share the problem, how to reach each other easily. We believe Fresh or Trash is a solution. It's a butter platform that unites art buyers and artists. It navigates art buyers to gain good quality art. It also helps artists to promote their artworks and to find new clients. The platform is powered by machine learning algorithm that facilitates barters. It allows forming customized selections based on demand history. It provides uh, selections 
and even predicting outcomes. General and domestic pandemic shifts reflected on generations' values and purposes. Gen Z is the audience we are interested in. With spending power of $143 billion, these young adults are the powerful consumers' blog, and they seek meaningful experiences and connections in their lives. According to Art Basel and UBS Art Market Report 2020, Gen Zs are mostly interested in affordable art. More than 1 billion of new art lovers appeared while pandemic. At the same time, 2020 was challenging for artists. 98% of newly created artworks remained unsold. So, Fresh and Trash is a customer-to-customer -customer platform that helps to make the better barter choices. Fresh and Trash provides the transaction option. Users can exchange goods and services for art without using money or can pay for the deal if they have no relevant offers at the moment. As about the traction, Fresh and Trash was started in 2020 as a barter board. Today, we have 4,000 users in four countries and the aim is to create the international water platform. We launched the MVP in Europe, then scale to the United States and then to Asia. The main thing is the algorithm. It makes the water deal special, quick and involving. The team now consists of seven IP programmers, those who work on backend and frontend, the data scientists who create the algorithm and smart contracts, the basis for ongoing customization and the law advisor. In the first version of the platform, there are, there are two main channels of monetization, paid subscription for unlimited number of offers and the commission for the same deal. There are also fees for the local logistic partners and with the growth of the targeted audience, there are also contracts with brands, ESG companies at market and market influencers. By connecting art buyers and artists, Fresh or Trash supports zero waste trend. Butter changes today's consumption and production patterns so it's a more sustainable future. Butter is the right way for a better lifestyle. So we invite you personally to exchange goods and services for art in an easy and engaging way. Here we're leaving our QR code and our contacts for further communication. Let's barter. Thank you, Xenia. Let's barter and let's uh, reply to the questions. Who will be the, I mean, uh, good policeman or bad policeman is uh, on the row? I leave okay. it to you, Rox. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was a, that, that's, a, that's a, quite an innovative perspective on um, a very traditional transactional network. I, I really like it. Uh, could you please describe how you use Telegram to test your theories and hypotheses and what was the result? Uh, of course, uh, the Telegram is a messenger that uh, allows uh, forming the sets of algorithms for social networking users. And it was a proof of concept for us in uh, four countries. And today with the users in the board, we, we make them our users for the further application because we made the surveys with them we made the uh, questions and open talks with them and we understand the users experience and it helped us very much to take the real feedback thank you thank you, thank you so much that's great i love the name also it's very bold <laughs> fresh and trash i think <laughs> Oh, it makes you like, it spikes the curiosity. It's like, what is that about? So that's great. Kudos to you guys. Sounds good. Daniels? Thank you. Well, uh, I have one question I haven't uh, asked Xenia before, I mean, during the mentorship process, but I wonder, uh, maybe it's not the best time to ask uh, such a question, but uh, uh, in between art and goods, what is fresh or what is trash? How do you define that? I say that the user decides, actually. Good. Great answer. <laughs> Good. Great answer. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The user and, uh, but before the user of the investor would decide, I should admit. Uh, <laughs> but, but I believe it's, a, it's, uh, it's attractive. It's attractive. Thank you, Xenia. Thank you. So um, I mentioned uh, Anders Peterson. 
several minutes ago. Um, one year ago, he made a, a brilliant panel, a brilliant webinar uh, regarding Gen Zs. And he circled out the four habits of Gen Zs. So the most important habit was uh, gamification and control over gamification. So the fourth panel, a uh, panelist, sorry, the, the fourth uh, startup uh, represents uh, gamification. Gamification plus the art market. And I should admit it's the only startup of the four uh, whose founder, uh, Alina Krukova, comes from the art world, not tech, not uh, legal, uh, not a uh, banking system. Yeah. So, yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Let's start. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much for amazing discussion and amazing panel. Uh, my name is Alina Krukova. I'm art entrepreneur and um, collector, founder of Astra Contemporary Art Gallery from Moscow, Russia. So I'm happy to present you our startup called Subtle, a platform for investments in artistic careers the combination of art investment and gamification. You know that as a result of COVID-19, the players of the art market have changed. A new generation of collectors came from the game industry, Gen Z, and they've got four main investment habits. Gen Z want control, support, gamification of investment, and social benefits by showing off their activity. So at the same time, due to the global pandemic, galleries representing the artists lost many of the collectors and are looking for new instruments which could help them to involve Gen Z and their investments in the art market. But they don't know how to speak with this new generation of collectors. So we can see that Gen Z investors remain unhappy and the artists remain unsolved. Uh, but you can ask me how big their market is. Um, look, at the game industry, Gen Z spend more than $2 billion on developing their games hero, game heroes. And at the same time, galleries spend more than 16 billion dollars on development of their artists. So we've got the solution. Saturn provides a relief to the all art market players, gamifying the investment process. Gen Z can support a real artist, like a game hero, receiving both financial and social profit, and the galleries get a new funding vehicle for their artists. So how does it work? First, the customer picks up the artist from the artistic universe based on his or her current status, including academic and marketing achievements. Then the uh, customer chooses the field or field of activity of the artist that could be developed from a list of 16 areas of production and promotion. After investments, the customer could track how the funds are spent by the gallery and see the improvements in the career. Of course, during the investment period, the customer received bonuses and uh, rewards. You know, it's very important for Gen Z. And finally, the customer can withdraw his funds, converting it into special grades and privileges from the paintings of artists. The more he invests, the more privileges he receives. Uh, so how we sort of can monetize it? Our business model is based on um, gallery subscription for using the platform, of course. Uh, and investors pay performance and success fee. It's typical for um, any classical uh, hedge funds. And if um, the investor trade their assets on the secondary market inside the platform, we also receive a transaction fee. Later on, we'll add in-house marketing agency and school of our traders as the revenue channels. A little bit about our history. We are starting researching the market in late 2020. And in January 2021, elaborated the idea of certain. Our team has created the internal logic of the platform, helped customer discovery inside the galleries and artists, as well as Gen Z as investors. We've also tested our front end, created and started elaborating the indices needed for rating and predicting career development. And, uh, you know, when the NFT boom began, we decided to add digital artists to some. Um, this year, 2021, we are planning to receive pre-seed investment to create MVP. And I need uh, to know that, I need to say that we are, have already received interest from 50 plus galleries in participating in our platform all around the world and more than 150 plus signups from the Gen Z side. In 2022, next year, Sardon should be released on App Store and Google Play and will show our first cash flow. And uh, according to our plans in 2023, we are to open an online school for our traders in reaching our devoted audience. Um, about people, the core of our team 
consists of one model founder, me, having more than six years of experience in the art market and business administration. The tech team includes three main positions, responsible for front-end, back-end data science and QA analysis, and several trendsetters, thanks to all of them of the art market, uh, of the art world, have become our mentors, like Roxana, thank you, from Christis, and Thomas from Golden High. So, to recap, to sum up all of this, Sardon has three main objectives. First, we are creating a new game with the new rules, with a new language for the new era of the art market, because we understand the players from both sides and can speak both Gen Z and galleries languages. Second, we offer unique approach in the art investment strategy based on independent index of career development, including more than 50 market signals validated by the galleries. And finally, we are going to create a new community of professional art players by opening a new school of art traders. So, hope you'll find new opportunities on our platform and we are looking forward to having you on Saturn. Thank you. Well done. Questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the questions. All right. Maybe I'll, I'll 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 go ahead and throw one in if that's all right. Yes, one of the most successful art startups ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. So, a uh, wonderful presentation, by the way. Very well done. Mm -hmm. uh, very clean. Loved it. Um, so my, my only real question is uh, why you've chosen to work with galleries and not to work at all with artists directly? Oh, Natasha, thank you for this question because, um, you know, we've got um, two main reasons for this. Because first one is um, securing our customers, um, young investors, uh, on international art scene. And you know that artistic careers are managed by um, the galleries as a business uh, entities and galleries create marketing plans, uh, spreadsheets, operate with the funds and budget and report to us. So a long term gallery contract serves as a market of uh, marker of reliability. And the second reason is, uh, of course, we are trying to reduce our costs. So contemporary gallery uh, have in average 22 or 23 artists in their you know, roster. So subscribing only one gallery to certain means that we are um, we, that we receive uh, in excess to several dozens of artists. Mm. And it reduces yeah. the cost on legal services and management stuff because it's easier to work with, you know, 10 galleries uh, than with uh, 200 or 300 artists as well. For sure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Good answer. Thank yeah. you. Mm. Thank you. So. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Alina. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to welcome the rest of the startups. Let's see how how many startup could uh, stream your Apologies in advance if you all hear my, my son gleefully screaming <laughs> with laughter out in the hallway. <laughs> I think he got excited. You know, we all have babies here. Speeches. We all have babies here. He was like, startup, startup. startups. Founders. So, yeah. And they are like, also screaming. <laughs> they are also screaming and uh, need attention. So, uh, <laughs> Katya, well, what would you thank say? You. Yes, I would love to thank all of you guys. I think um, amazing job. I know everyone was a slightly nervous, um, but I think it went well. Um, ladies, thanks a lot for all your questions and mentorship. I think it's been super valuable. Um, Dennis, well, you're the rock star also putting all this together. Um, th thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah. Lots of respect. Uh, um, maybe you tell us what's coming next and what should everyone expect? Well, uh, thank you, Katya. Thank you for your kind words. It was a pleasure to, to work with uh, you and to continue working with you as well as with uh, our mentors. Um, so we're looking forward to the new uh, year with the new rules, uh, which will be announced um, quite soon after uh, finalizing the uh, demo day results. And of course, uh, for the four representatives for the four startups, namely Arterium, uh, VR, Trash and Trash and Saturn, it's uh, just the beginning, just the beginning of the, uh, of the big life of uh, uh, 
MVP creation for one startups or uh, for uh, increasing their cash flow for the others. Uh, it's the beginning of uh, hopefully invest investment relations. And uh, thank you. It was a pleasure to work with you and it was a great opportunity. Thank you for your uh, for your yes. Uh, one year ago, where when during the pandemic, we, we decided to, to work together in this combined uh, pandemic business model of uh, private acceleration, which has uh, led to the uh, to what we see now. And uh, thank you again, Roxana, my uh, honored co-founder and uh, the board member. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, it's your turn to uh, finalize and polish go-to-market strategy of uh, some of the startups and hope you'll see in a while. Uh, thank you, Katya, for being the investment partner and uh, the lead investor of the investment round along with some undisclosed uh, representatives from the um, among the art strategists. So uh, regarding, uh, I mean, now I'd like to say a few words for uh, the for the guests of uh, today's demo day. So instead of closing remarks, uh, well, uh, subscribe to our newsletters. We are um, we're trying to create uh, one uh, analytical article regarding art tech or art finance uh, per, per week. So we also aggregate the art tech news. So for that, you could also subscribe to our news and uh, to our Telegram channel, Telegram tested by Xenia for, from Fresh Trash. So, and... Um, we're thinking about uh, the next round, about the next year. Uh, our aim is to pursue the establishment of the art tech dynamic community by keeping in touch. And we look forward to see you during further events by Fuel Arts, hopefully uh, during Art Basel this December in Miami. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Bye. Cheers to more demo days. Yeah, Thank you guys. Thank you guys. It was Thank such fun. Much. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you, Thank you Dennis. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for lots. Bye-bye.